Okay. Um, the only thing I can say before I get into the more of the community engagement, which is really my area of expertise, um, about our, our, our survey that we recently completed um, this year in the northern Bering Sea, um, is that we did, well, in 2017, we conducted a survey in the northern Bering Sea, um, and we did see an increase in um, uh, orange-purple sea stars over the last time that we had done a Northern Bering Sea Survey, which was in 2010. Um, we just recently completed, in the last couple of weeks, a survey, a partial survey of the Northern Bering Sea this year, and we did, uh, again, see um, um, quite a few purple-orange uh, sea stars. I can't speak to the wasting disease. Um, I just know that we've seen an increase in sea stars in that northern uh, range. And we'll have that, that data worked up and hopefully uh, the scientists that work on that survey will be able to share that with you um, in a future date. One of the, um, the, the key things I'm gonna focus on is, is the community engagement that we've been doing in the Northern Bering Sea. And um, we do a number of surveys. Um, one of them is our bottom trawl survey and that hits species typically that are just off the bottom up into the midwater column. That includes pollock and, uh, uh, you know, sea stars occasionally, they come up when another species is eating them and um, they come up in the stomach sometimes of some of the fish. Uh, we also sample crabs with that survey and we're in the process right now of conducting a survey where we're uh, focused on the upper water column and the, the larval fish and the plankton, zooplankton. So that's underway right now, so I expect we'll have a lot of information on that in the next few weeks. These two surveys in particular, uh, the upper midwater column survey that's ongoing now and the bottom trawl survey, we have been um, expanding our community outreach to um, engage stakeholders uh, and let them know what we're doing in the region as well as share um, initial results and uh, final results. Uh, and the key thing that we do when we, we start to um, engage in the communities is we, uh, we walk, we go in and we try to find individuals that are, um, uh, that can help us organize. We, we're not um, residents. And you know, typically a government agency may come into a uh, community and hold town hall meetings and uh, organize it themselves. And we find that it's a lot more effective if we work with local experts, the communications networks in the community. So we work a lot with Sea Grant, we work with community uh, organizations, Alaska Native corporations that are based in the communities that we're going into. In Nome, it's, it's organizations like Coeric um, and, um, and Sea Grant in particular. Uh, and so we enlist their help in reaching out to the uh, villages that surround the Bering State region. And one of the things with trial and error we've learned is the limitations of technology. These are remote villages and, uh, you know, we come in there with PowerPoint presentations that are uh, a lot of megabytes and we realize that people can't download them. So we've um, We've gotten a little more savvy with some help um, recognizing the limitations and that people have to get you know, PowerPoints in advance and try to keep them as simple as possible so that they're not a lot of bandwidth. And then the key thing for us too is we, we try to develop handouts uh, and presentations that use plain language. And that's tough for scientists. Um, they're, I think they, they, I've been with the Alaska Fisheries Science Center now for four years. They didn't have a communications program uh, outreach person. They've had outreach staff, but they didn't really have somebody helping them fine-tune their presentations and turn them more into plain English uh, in the past. And so I think this is a, a learning curve and more and more of our scientists, I hope, are getting uh, much more savvy about speaking to the general population about their work and, and putting it in language they can understand. Uh, so something else that we've been really trying to enforce with our staff is recognizing um, that people we all receive information differently and uh, we all um, respond to information differently and have different ways of communicating. And so getting our scientists to be more appreciative, particularly when they go into Alaska Native communities that people do perceive and receive and communicate in different ways, to be more appreciative of that. And so we're trying um, and hopefully we will get some grants. Um, our 
communications program is trying to uh, put some of our scientists through some some cultural awareness training and there's a number of great organizations um, in Alaska that are, are providing those services. I think something that we've also become more aware of is the need to really have customized training depending on the communities you're going into because Alaska is a very diverse, um, the Alaska Native communities are quite diverse and there's a lot of different languages spoken and uh, subtleties in the way people communicate and so if you can work with a group that is doing some kind of training in a local community then you're you're better off than having somebody that might be training um, in southeast Alaska if you're going up into Nome for instance. Um, let me go to my next slide. Uh, so what we've been doing with our communications is trying to take a three-pronged approach in, and I think a lot of the researchers uh, that are working with uh, North Pacific Research Board, uh, Monies, or, you know, BOEM, I know you guys, uh, you're ahead of us in communications, as is U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I think you guys have been working in communities, doing a lot more outreach and engagement for a number of years, and I think we're... Um, maybe a little late to the table at the, the fishery service side of the house. We, we haven't had to do as much, and I think we're learning now. Um, and our process is becoming a little bit more engaged, involved. And so we are uh, developing um, flyers in advance of going into communities, and we're trying to put them again in plain English, include photos of the researchers, include bios, include a, an objective of the research, um, if we're doing survey stations in a general area, providing all the a map with all the survey stations so people can see where we're going to be, um, explaining what we're looking for and why we're doing that, and how the information is a benefit to the communities that we're, um, that we're going to be impacting or that will uh, are surrounding the areas where we are surveying. We also try to go into a community beforehand and do seminars, uh, conference calls, in-person meetings, explain again what we're doing, why we're doing it, um, provide contact information for people that want to ask questions. Then when we're doing the survey, um, we're trying to provide more real-time information. Um, we're, we set up email lists, provide uh, information via email with updates on what survey stations we're sampling for a given day, um, and a little update of what we saw the previous day in terms of the species we're, we're encountering. Um, and then um, we also are using the uh, radio to communicate locations. Initially, when we started doing this real-time communication, the real goal was to make sure that we were not interfering with any subsistence hunting or fishing activities, and so we could communicate where we are and make sure that we were not um, interfering with any activities that were taking place. And I think it's evolving a little bit where we're trying to provide a little more real-time information of what we're actually seeing while we're out there. Um, and then after the survey is completed, um, we're trying to give a quick update if we can, right, if we're able to come into the, a port that is local in the case of if we're doing the Northern Bering Sea, we're trying to make sure that we're coming in and out of Nome, and then at least holding um, uh, some lectures there with Sea Grant um, through, through the straight science talks, or uh, doing radio interviews or newspaper interviews, um, conference calls with villages surrounding the Bering Strait region to bring them up to speed on initial um, survey results. And then um, we go back and we've trying to produce a report each year um, that we do a survey that's a little bit more public friendly. Uh, the hope at some point we'll translate some of this stuff into uh, native languages. We don't have the resources to do that right now, but that's um, on the, the agenda to do in the future. But at least providing uh, pictures of the species that we're seeing um, and updates on what the abundance looked like in past surveys and what it currently looks like. Um, and we're, you know, trying to translate what we can into um, spoken languages, you pick and you know, if we, if we um, can get help doing that. Uh, and then we, we distribute that report, um, uh, mostly through Sea Grant or through a mailing list. Uh, and then we um, follow up with a um, presentations to the communities to, to go over those reports again pretty much the same kind of process that we followed to do the pre-survey uh, where we do 
you know, radio interviews and newspaper because that's a good way to re reach a broad audience um, and in meetings uh, via conference call with villages and native corporations, as well as any community groups that are in the Nome area and a straight science talk. Uh, the key thing that we're learning as we do this is that we present what we find, but we also listen. We're listening to what the community has to answering their questions, but also hearing um, their observations about what they're seeing out there. And then we're we're hoping this is laying a foundation for us to do more cooperative work, uh, collaborative research in the future. And so for us, we realize that it's really important that we make a commitment to keep engaged with the communities. Um, and, and that three-pronged process for us is important because I think it keeps everybody informed about what we're doing before we do it, what we're doing during our survey, and what we found after the survey is completed. And, and we're, um, we're looking for opportunities to go beyond just providing updates about the federally required surveys that we have to do and find opportunities potentially through federal monies or grant programs to engage scientists, uh, federal scientists with local community um, members to do cooperative research. Uh, and that's where I think we really come into the whole discussion of knowledge co-production research. And that's where we can get both groups to the table recognizing their different expertise that they bring to the table um, and build research plans that everybody can buy into and that everybody endorses where everybody feels they're getting something out of it. So we see the engagement that we've undertaken so far as a starting point. And we're certainly open to feedback on what we could be doing better, what's not working. Um, but we, I know from the scientists that I've gone up with that there is a definite interest in, in more cooperative, collaborative research and looking for opportunities to do that. And I think it all comes down to um, building a sense of respect for the fact that, again, we all bring a lot to the table. The Western scientists have that broad perspective, um, local communities, local Na Alaska Native members, hunters, fishers have that on the water experience, that, that generational experience, the knowledge of the ecosystem over time on a regular daily basis. And I think marrying the two efforts will only lead to better research and a better understanding of our marine ecosystems. And so that's, I think in a nutshell, what we do. I'm, I'm happy to take any questions that anybody has. Um, we can do it in chat if you wanna type in a question or I think if you uh, have a, a microphone and you want to ask a question, we can do it that way too. Great, thanks so much, Maggie. Um, maybe while you're unsharing your screen, I'll, I'll reiterate that if there's any questions folks have, feel free to feel free to let us know now, or you can put them in the chat and we'll get to them as well. And if not, then we can Morgan, move on with. I had a question. Oh yeah, go ahead. Are your citizen scientists actually out on the boat with you or is this more informational um, for the community that may be observing your boats or um, like how engaged are they? We're just, we've offered the opportunity um, to have people come out on the boats with us. So far, people haven't taken us up on it. Partly, I think that's because we haven't had the funding in the past to do that. And we've been now, you know, we have to bring funding to the table. It's also a big commitment for somebody to come out on a boat with us because our surveys were at least out for three weeks at a time. That's wow. the minimum. So it's a really big commitment. Um, but we're also looking to, to bring in school students that might in the communities that might want to use this towards their their degrees and get that that practical experience. So that's one thing we're looking at. The other thing we're willing to do is, um, and we have done on the past surveys, is if people have specific projects that they want to do, um, like they need to collect seawater because they want to test for algae or um, algal blooms, harmful algal blooms. Then we're um, if people provide us the resources and a, um, the tools and then we know where to send samples to when we're completing the survey, we're happy to do some of that extra work on our surveys. So those are right now, but the goal eventually will be to get more people engaged coming out on our federal surveys, but also to look for opportunities to develop um, surveys and projects that we 
design together from the, the base up. <clears throat> okay, thanks. Um, so Meredith or uh, Jessica, do we have Heather's presentation? Um, yes, we it looks like the presentation. Would I be able to just comment on uh, Marjorie's presentation um, on communication? Or Maggie, I'm sorry. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, so um, I guess a little bit more background about myself. I am an Arctic Youth Ambassador, but I'm also um, Alaska Native, and I'm from Unalakleet and Elam, so in Bering Straits. And I currently live in uh, Nome now, and I work for the um, the hospital here. Um, but I'm kind of mostly I'm just here to be a fly on the wall. But also, um, I was in a discussion last week about the importance of discussions and communications between um, any Arctic researchers and the indigenous community. And I just want to commend you for sharing, listening, and learning, and what does that mean, and recognizing each person for their knowledge, even though if it's not in the Western sense. Thank you. You're very welcome. And I think we still have a long way to go, but we're, we're starting. <laughs> so, Amy, John, did you have a question? Yeah, so this is, uh, let me, this is Amy Holman from NOAA. Um, one of the things that I am curious about is you know, you've got folks like Maggie trying to really work with our scientists and uh, help us communicate. And I know that happens in other agencies as well. Some of us do better than others. Uh, but one thing is we're kind of, you know, and, and Maggie did talk about trying to reach out to others, but we're all kind of still doing this in um, somewhat of a from our agency out perspective and particularly from for those of you who are <laughs> commenting from um, different part other places than Anchorage or elsewhere uh, what's the sense is anybody hearing or is anybody interested or anybody want to comment I guess I'll just put it that way on ways that particularly let's just keep it to federal agencies right now might do better about coming together and sharing their information in communities or regional hubs? Amy, this is Heather Coletti. I'll um, chime in here a little bit um, from the park pr service perspective. And I, I, I don't work in the, I mean, I've done a little bit of work in the Arctic, but, but a similar um, issue we've had, of course, is, is um, these seabird die-offs. And how do we communicate with the local communities, but then also all the other federal agencies, particularly Fish and Wildlife and, and USGS um, and the National Wildlife Health Center lab, you know, to coordinate all of those responses. We don't have an answer yet, except that there seems to be, you know, just a couple of individuals from each agency that, you know, are constantly trying to keep just each other in the loop. And what we have done um collaboratively and I, and I have to give credit to fish and wildlife for this is put out um you know one page flyers updates and it allow it with all of us and all of our information um you know whether it's logos or what we found in the local community lo everybody puts their two cents into those outreach pieces and then you know, from, again, from the Park Service perspective, we're fortunate because we have some offices actually in those communities. So Nome, Kotzebue, where there can be some local, you know, on the ground communication. But it, it's a lot of, it was a lot of work. It was a lot more work than I think any of us anticipated just to come out with a little flyer that, you know, we all agreed upon, but, but I think well worth it in, in a lot of ways. Thanks, Heather. One of the reasons, this is Amy Holman again, one of the reasons why I ask is there's some talk around NOAA you know, about um, how can we do better, how can we do better at this whole be, uh, approach of, of communicating our information? And there's questions about, there's a poll 
a pull push or a tug and I'll explain what I mean by that is that we've had presences in like through the National Weather Service and others in local communities and as many of our agencies are feeling the pressure to shrink and to come move out of those locations because we need to centralize for various regions reasons there's also this push to say hey we really need to be having a presence out in the communities if we run, really want to have strong relationships so i'm kind of curious about whether how that's if anybody wants to comment on that hi amy this is liana um and i live in barrow i've done a lot of community outreach and stakeholder relations um, in the last 15 years and working with a lot of science groups and federal agencies. Um, recently, well, in the last year and a half, I've been working with um, our village corporation, UIC, and they have the science division up here. And one of the initiatives that they've taken is to hold all summer, and there's a lot of people who actually showed up from the community and with all the scientists being here during the entire summer, they hold, instead of doing one large science fair symposium at the end of the summer with all of the researchers, they did it into um, weekly updates. So every Friday they had something going on each week. And then all of the community members would go out there. So they would do something with the kids and the other youth during the daytime and they also had interns but then in the evening they would have it where they would have dinner and snacks and the rest of the community members would go out there after work hours and that seemed to go over really well all summer and it was also covered by several um, media outlets but they also um, worked with our radio station as well because a lot of the people here don't know about stuff even though if it's on social media internet or flyers but the community members usually know about things via the radio so they worked with our radio station all summer as well thanks all right well thanks for the great discussion everyone um I think I might have overbooked us, but we have two more talks that I'd like to give folks an opportunity to, to give today, but I don't want to stifle any discussion as well, so we'll keep trying to do both. Um, did I get Heather's presentation up correctly, or do we still need to load that? John, if you could just uh, put it into presentation mode. Do you know how to do that? Nope. Okay. Um, bottom right corner, you see a little uh, zoom zero to uh, or negative and plus sign it says 95% button right next to on the left I think yeah um, for some reason it's not going <laughs> okay actually could you try clicking oh now it just disappeared <laughs> you have it did you minimize it let's try this again all right, is it there now? Um, yes, but it's not in presentation mode. So actually, will you try clicking slideshow on the top bar? Yeah. I don't know, resume. know what that, yeah. Try clicking resume, yeah, see if that works. <laughs> uh, I can also share my screen because I have it up too. All right, let's do that. Thanks, Jessica. Sorry. I apologize. I reached out to our IT and they just said, no, we don't do Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> um, while we're chatting, let me just point out, I shared in the chat the link to the event page and you're welcome to ask questions or make comments on that discussion there and we can continue the conversation. Okay, so, Heather, I think your presentation's up. Okay. Um, so my name is Heather Coletti. I work with the um, National Park Service uh, Southwest Alaska Inventory and Monitoring Program, which is one of the um, partners with Gulf Watch Alaska. And that's a multi-agency um, NGO university uh, group that's, that's um, 
supported by the Exxon Valdez Oil Spill Trustee Council, as, as John was saying earlier. Um, I want to give uh, this talk, Brenda Konar actually put this talk together. She's, she's giving this talk at a dive conference in a few weeks. Um, so I've got to give her all the credit. And hopefully I'll be able to answer any of your questions. Um, but we'll just move right on through. Next slide. I think we all um, are aware of the role of, of sea stars. And, and we're particularly focused in, in this regard in the inner title. Uh, we know they certainly exist subtitly, but we all of our monitoring is done uh, essentially in the inner tidal. So we know that they're ecologically important. Um, they can play a variety of roles, uh, in particular grazers, predators, and or scavengers. Um, and we also know that they play a key role in, in trophic cascades and, and, and in particular the nearshore food web, which next slide, number three. I'm just going to give a quick overview of our Gulf Watch sampling in general because sea stars are a critical piece of that. And these are all the folks um, that I work with on the nearshore component of Gulf Watch Alaska. And, and our role, or really our, our driving force in the monitoring is not just to detect trends, but to also potentially um, be able to answer questions about why things are changing or what are the drivers of change. Which leads us into um, slide number four, is this conceptual model. This is a conceptual model of the nearshore food web. And, and that's really all the different elements of what we monitor are part of this web. So essentially if we see, and I'll get into this a little bit, declines in sea stars, what is going to be the ecological response in the near shore? Um, and those are, are, are things that we can look at because of the variety of metrics that we're measuring um, in this ecosystem. Let's, uh, so slide number five. Now, not only is it nested in terms of a, of a food web approach, but from this map, you can see that our study sites span uh, a, a 500 kilometer linear stretch of the Gulf of Alaska. So we have really nice spatial coverage um, of these areas. And these areas were chosen because of the spill and, and spill affected uh, recovery. So we have um, Prince William Sound in the farthest northeast, Kenai Fjords is in that light blue, Ketchmag Bay is in the red, and Katmai is in the green. And, and those are just our inner tidal sites, but we're doing all sorts of work uh, in these regions from bird surveys to sea otter surveys, um, and then our inner tidal work. So let's get into sea stars specifically. Next slide, please. Um, we sample annually, anywhere between um, April and June, but I will say per region, it's the same time every year. We just can't be in all four places at the same time. So we're looking for those low, summer low tides, and, um, and we do the same sites annually, and it's essentially 100, anywhere from a 50 to 100 meter long transect along the low inner tidal, and we're counting uh, sea stars to estimate density. And we started this uh, in uh, about 2006 in Katmai, 2007 in um, Kenai Fjords, Prince William Sound, I think it was 2008, and Ketchumac Bay uh, was a little bit earlier. So we have a, a pretty good time series of, of data at this point. Okay, slide seven. Um, and our study goals, again, to determine spatial and temporal trends in sea star abundance and species diversity at sites across the Gulf of Alaska. And then secondly, not that this was part of the monitor, because we came up with a monitoring plan before the wasting disease um, became apparent. But again, we want to look, we want to be able to um, see the effects of a de decline in our monitoring of the sea stars and how does that manifest itself in other species or metrics in the near shore. So um, slide eight, this is just some NMDS uh, plots that Brenda did to essentially show 
the spatial variability of sea star communities. So even though these are all, all of these sites are within the Gulf of Alaska, they're really different by region. Um, you can see how they've separated out by region. And all this is showing is that the sea star community, the species assemblage for each region is very different. So it's different by space. And then next slide, number nine. It's also different over time. Um, so it is variable, uh, which can be challenging. Um, the addition, in addition to the high temporal uh, variability in abundance, diversity, and dominance of this individual, of these species vary greatly among the blocks, among our regions. So, so we're going to dive into the regions specifically. Uh, let's see, next slide. Katmai National Park and Preserve. And, and really what I want you um, to look at is, again, it's going to be different species that are the major players in these. There's some overlap, of course. But where we are sitting in terms of numbers in these last few years. So Katmai, almost zero still. And this decline started in about 2015. Next slide for Ketchumac Bay. Again, low density for some number, some species, but um, the major players, Evisterius, still down to zero. Mm -hmm. Slide number 12, Kenai Fjords. A big decline uh, in 2014-15. We're starting to see a little bit of recovery in Pisasters and Dermisterius, but again, still really low numbers from what we've, we've seen in the past. And finally, Western Prince William Sound, um, again, big declines, uh, 2015, not really any recovery that we, we can uh, recognize yet. So when you go to slide 14, all the species, um, these are all species combined across regions. The crash is really obvious in Katmai and Ketchumac Bay, and there's some recovery that we're starting to see in Western Prince William Sound and, and Kenai Fjords. And we've attributed this to the sea star wasting disease. Because it's been seen across such a wide um, uh, area, so spatially and species diversity, so it's hit a bunch of different species and has been seen across the Gulf, that kind of a decline, we're, we're assuming it's um, disease related. We have observed some sea stars with disease. But the problem with Alaska, as uh, all of you probably know, is um, it's hard to access, logistics are challenging, and we're limited in, in how much we can um, monitor. So we go to these sites once a year, and um, my understanding of the disease is that it only takes a few days and the stars are dead and they could be, you know, they're gone. And so we might miss that actual um, observation of a diseased star. But what we're seeing is in just a general decline in the densities. So in summary, this is slide 15. Um, I don't know, my presentation's crashing. Ah, okay. <laughs> All sea stars save for the Dermisterius crashed at Prince William Sound in Kenai Fjords. We had a near complete crash of all sea stars in Katmai and Kachemak Bay. And there is a la general lack of dermisterius in these areas anyway. Um, and we're starting to see some recruitment. And when I say recruitment, um, we also classify the stars by uh, juveniles or adults. So we're starting to see some, a few juveniles in Prince William Sound and Kenai Fjord, not really in Ketchumac Bay or Katmai. Next slide. So our, our next steps. We'll continue to do this work. This is a long-term monitoring program. Um, we, of course, would like to see if these new recruits uh, continue to establish themselves in Kenai and Prince William Sound, and, and if we will, you know, hope to observe some in Kachemak Bay and Katmai. And really, the 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 one. Um, Number three is what I'm really interested in is sort of the impacts on the community caused by the loss of this um, intertidal predator. And as a side note, um, we also measure uh, various metrics with mussels. Um, 
And what we've seen preliminarily in Katmai, we haven't looked at the other regions yet, is that muscle populations are expanding and they're expanding into the lower inner tidal, which is in general where the sea stars play that role as a predator, right? They keep those muscle beds from extending too far down into the subtitle. We are starting to see that expansion of these muscles into those systems. Um, what does that mean long term? What's the lag of um, sea star recovery and muscle populations? We don't really know, but it was um, pretty evident this summer that those muscle beds um, and muscle populations along the Katmai coast are, um, how do I say, maybe taking advantage of the lack of predators. Uh, and the last one, examine environmental drivers. So, so again, we've seen these differences in sea star species distributions and abundances across the Gulf. You know, what drives those differences? Um, and and we, we have an, uh, some environmental data, temperature, uh, salinity, um, currents, some other uh, exposure, things that environmental drivers that we can look at that might be influencing uh, these species com community dynamics. And I think the interesting question will be as well is, as they recover, will they recover to similar community composition that they were before the crash? Or is it gonna look, is it gonna be a different group of species or a different abundance um, than we've seen in the past? Uh, next slide. And uh, this is just an acknowledgement slide of all the folks um, that uh, that helped pull all this work together. Um, and I, if I, if there are any questions, I, I hope I didn't go through that too fast. But I'm looking at the clock. I'm sorry. No, that's great. Thanks so much, Heather. Uh, this is Guillermo. I have a quick question. Sure. Uh, what the uh, spatial ex extent of the sea star in the Gulf of Alaska and, and beyond? Uh, can you find those in the Bering Sea, for instance, or uh, to the south of the Gulf of Alaska? The disease? No, the, the sea star uh, pop, pop, uh, population. Uh, well, I, um, I, you know what I. I can't speak. I do know there's another monitoring site in southeast Alaska um, that I believe um, Sarah, yeah, are you might might discuss. But as far as our extent or, or our long-term monitoring sites, it's just been this chunk of Alaska. And I don't, besides in southeast, maybe Sitka. I don't think there's any other long-term monitoring of stars in Alaska. Yeah, and this is John. I, I wonder too, of Guillermo, are you asking about just general distribution patterns of sea stars, you know, throughout the Bering and the Pacific? Um, yes. Uh, yeah. My my question is because these uh, variations that we see over time at at these locations, uh, what's what's the scale of those variations? If the sea star is only located there, well, this is important because uh, that's um, their habitat has a range of, let's say, 500 uh, kilometers. But if they are all over the Gulf of Alaska in the Bering Sea, then these uh, temporal variations will have, have a, a really small uh, scale of uh, variability. And then um, the interpretation uh, will be different. Yeah, so, yeah, so if, if folks don't mind, folks don't if, you, mind. if you have any ideas on where to find information on abundance and distribution big you know big scale for sea stars if you could put that in the chat that would be great because I was looking for that too but I'd like to give Sarah Gray from a chance to give her presentation so maybe we can get that one going and then see if we have time at the end for questions well to speak to the question at hand um, before I go there are quite a lot of long-term monitoring in other areas especially in the lower 48 so the trends that um, Heather showed are pretty much all over the west coast of North America. There is, as far as we know, not too many places that have escaped the fate. Um, Alaska actually was one of the last holdouts. So as far as the species crashes that you're seeing in her graphs, those happened later and at first were less intense 
than the one as you move south it just got worse so um as far as like the worrisomeness and the generality of the trends that she's talking about it's really general and it's lots of species and it's for many species their entire populations range um i don't know about the species that can go up further into the bering sea may have some pockets and refuges up there where they haven't been as affected but you know we don't sample up there very well so um it's possible that that's less intense up there or less devastating but if you go down into california i mean those lines are flat for most of the species so thank you that answers my question thank you yeah um should i share my screen now that'd be great okay All right. All right. Do you guys see my just my PowerPoint slide or do you see my presenter view? Presenter view. Okay, that's fine. I will not use it then. Oh, uh, I think you can swap the displays. There's probably a button. There you go. Yep. That was oh, great. Okay. Well, I, I just went into normal view. Where is it? Swap displays. Yeah, do you okay. see a button on the top left? That something like displays or anything? Um, no. That's okay. I don't really need it. Okay, sorry about that. That's okay. I should have asked earlier. Okay, so um, I'm going to minimize this a little bit so you guys don't see all that. So um, I'm a postdoc in Bruce Mangi and Jane Lubchenko's lab um, at Oregon State University. I'm part of the PISCO group, the Partnership for Interdisciplinary Studies of Coastal Oceans. It's a um, long-term monitoring, essentially, group that has was formed in the early 2000s, and it's a consortium of universities in mostly California and Oregon. Um, and I'm not going to go too much into my own research today. I'm going to tell you about some of the research, the collaborative um, uh, integrating I've been doing among research groups and then talk a bit about our citizen science uh, program. And so diving right into, uh oh, there we go. Uh, the citizen science program. This is actually data that have been contributed by citizen scientists on sea star wasting. So Right when this all came, went down um, in 2013, mar the Marine Group, which is another consortium research group that studies intertidal, put up a website where citizens could submit their observations of wasting. And it was a pretty hot topic here in uh, the news. So there were a lot of people that were interested. And this is, so this is June 2013 before we had any re uh, observations. And we'll go to July. October and so you can see it popped up in two distinct locales. It started in Puget Sound and in Central California um, separately and was absent from Oregon. So these aren't just lacks of observations. We were out looking um, and over so December it was really going um, and into March it kept going. June the next year it hit Oregon. So a year lag in Oregon and um, just kept going and I have a lot more data, but I wanted to give you guys the spatial expanse of how this looks. And these are all observations of wasting um, from Mexico to Alaska. So as far as uh, Guillermo's question earlier, this is spatially very expansive. We believe it's the most um, expansive and devastating epizootic on record, um, especially marine epis, or maybe marine epizootic on record. Um, and I wasn't going to go too much into the timeline or the history of it, but uh, as far as it goes, we think it was a virus, but there is now data that um, contradicts that. And so it may have many causes, or it may be a viral plus an environmental cause. Um, Regardless, it seems as if it can travel in the water um, pretty far and long distances pretty easily. It may have something to do with population density, but it's really not a prerequisite for it to be infective. Um, 
and we saw near 100% declines in many species and are an extreme declines like up to 60, 70, 90% in a lot of others. Um, a handful of sea star species escaped the disease. Um, and a lot of the data that uh, Heather just showed is really representative of all that. So to get into the citizen science and um, public sort of buy into this, the marine group, which is also uh, many of the marine folks are also in this task force that I'll tell you about in a moment. Um, they posted this page and it has just an, an interface where um, you can go to seastarwasting.org and submit your observations. And this has been invaluable to us as we try to figure out how this disease moved through the water, how long it lasted, and all of the other sort of disease dynamic information that we can't get without a lot of um, boots in the water or fins in the water. Um, so as I was, whoa, that's weird. I didn't do that. Um, you guys see those red lines? <laughs> um, as this all was happening, there's been just this explosion of research on the topic and we are starting to know enough to know, realize that we don't know anything. Um, <laughs> so we don't know a lot about the disease itself. We know what uh, we have seen the populations decline, but as far as like, how the ramifications are going to go over time is still a little up in the air. Um, I was part invited to write a grant with some folks who study a chytrid fungus and salamanders and um, a white nose syndrome in um, bats. It's a nose a respiratory fungus that they get. And we were on the phone talking about like transmission rates and inoculations and vaccines. And I'm like, this is not even close to where we are. We don't even know what this thing is. Um, we don't even know what species entirely were affected. We don't know if there are any left in, of some of the species. And anyway, it became very apparent in our conversations that we really needed to kind of sit down and as a group of researchers identify our knowledge gaps. And then, um, so we actually received a grant to do so. And uh, we rallied up a bunch of sea star wasting disease researchers and sat down in a room and identified those knowledge gaps. We are creating a response plan if sea star wasting disease reemerges. Re um, the task force is also considering any rehabilitation options, how viable they are, how realistic they are, uh, and how, ne how necessary, most importantly. And then um, along the, you know, further down the road, and this is really um, more general than just sea star wasting, but identifying some policy options for how we deal with these sort of sudden, um, very, yeah, very sudden outbreaks that need our attention right away, but the funding cycle, you know, takes years to get adequate funding to do it well. So <clears throat> within the Wasting Disease Task Force, we have identified four working groups. We have a diagnostics and epidemiology working group that's really working on what is the disease itself and how does it transmit and what are the, what's the pathogenesis of it. And then the ecological research and surveillance, that's really my forte. Um, I'm there studying how the muscle beds and the biodiversity of the Oregon intertidal and California intertidal are responding to the lack of this keystone predator, Pisaster. So I'm more focused on the intertidal myself, but there are plenty of people doing this subtitly with the other predators like Pycnopodia, the sunflower star. And then we have a management conservation and recovery group that's really focused on what are the viable options for say aquaculture of species that aren't recovering or how do we keep them healthy in the in an aquarium so that we can at least have a brood stock if it really becomes necessary and then sorts of things like translocations and other um management options like that have been thrown around. We haven't really settled on anything yet. Everyone's in complete disagreement about what the best thing is to do at this point, but we're trying to at least open the conversation now when we 
at least have for most of the species, there's a handful left. Um, and for some of the species, there's many left. Um, before it gets so dire that we're, you know, we only have 10 left and we have to figure out how to save them like the white abalone folks were. So and the last is uh, communication, outreach, and citizen science. We have the marine group is really heading this. They've been doing it for a long time, um, citizen science projects and getting high schoolers out in the intertidal and all this types of things. But now they're repurposing some of their existing infrastructure to really get at and collect real wasting disease data um, using citizen scientists. So this is the overarching structure of the task force. Um, the purple circles are the four working groups I just mentioned. From each of those, we have a handful of PIs that serve on the oversight committee that meet to talk about the, the direction and vision. And right now we're really heavily populated by academic scientists, but we don't want it to stay that way. We would love more state and federal agencies to become involved. We have pretty good representation from California Department of Fish and Wildlife and Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, but we would love more. We would love some NGO folks to get involved, um, aquarists and veterinarians, um, and then other stakeholders, the public, tribal um, interests, and et cetera. So any folks like you guys and whoever you know who may be interested in becoming part of this. We have a website uh, launched about a month ago. It's right there and I can send it out on the group discussion page later that, so you can check out our website. And then the other thing is we're coming up in another month here on a workshop that we're putting on. So it's focused on marine disease outbreaks and how um so there are a couple angles here one is about sea star wasting disease and gathering that stakeholder input on our strategic action plan but another more broad um part of this is finding a network and coordinating a group of people that can be mobilized if and when the next big marine disease outbreak occurs it became very obvious and apparent when this did happen that we were you know we're scrambling to go get tissue samples and um, hey, how's Alaska doing? And how's British Columbia doing? Uh, if we had more of a network in place and people were talking to each other beforehand, we'd be able to deal with these sort of sudden rapid response needed situations more quickly. And then um, getting into sort of the mitigation options for these types of outbreaks is another angle of that and um i think i shared it to the group but we are our strategic action plan is also online so this is it right here um it's on our website and um the, there's a bajillion co-authors brenda konar who heather who's heather works with is in it and we i invite you to go check it out and um yeah but I'll, I'd love to take your questions and I'd really love for everyone to share the information with uh, your colleagues and anyone interested and please send me an email if you'd like to come to the meeting or um, just be on our emails in the future. Great, thanks so much, Sarah. Are there any questions out there? Yeah, Jim Lima up here in Anchorage. Uh, just one. Uh, you mentioned the four working groups, one of them being uh, ecological research, the other and monitoring, the other one being uh, the outreach communications and citizen science. Is there any thought of building your citizen science into the ecological research and monitoring rather than the kind of an external communications and outreach? Yeah, so certainly all of these groups are intertwined and we had to break them somehow just so people could have a focus. Um, but one of the large components of monitoring is our citizen science push and that's always been that way and we will um, continue to make it that way. We want to actually increase the citizen science component of monitoring if we can. Um, so, and, and so any other feedback and suggestions on that are completely welcome. Thank you. Yeah. 
This is Heather. Thanks, Sarah. Um, you know, again, I, I mentioned this briefly at the beginning of the hour, but the, co the COAST, C-O-A-S-S-T, out of UW's model for citizen science and, and long-term monitoring might be something to check out. Okay. Do you and I've thought, actually, I've wondered about partnering with them, especially in these remote locations, where there's designated coast beaches, you know, it's always hard to add on to people's plate that it, when it's not their primary like job or, or piece, but, um, you know, would this be a place to look for sea stars as well? Because we have, um, this is sort of a side note, um, we had some folks up on the Seward Peninsula, kind of the Bering Land Bridge area, in June and then in late August, and massive amounts of dead sea stars on the beach, which really? apparently is, you know, not not common. But we don't really have baseline for that. And um, anyway, partnering with some of these these other efforts might be the best way to get get some pretty remote beaches yeah. surveyed. Yeah. Okay. Great. And your group obviously is one of the ones that we're relying on for the Alaskan, the Alaskan picture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? And Sarah, thanks for posting the, the advert about the, the meeting that you're having in October. Um, and I forgot to mention that at the beginning too, but if anyone has any other announcements, other meetings that this might group might be interested in. Um, it'd be great to share them now or put those in the chat box too. And I just really want to thank everyone for joining. Um, and sorry, was someone there just a minute ago? But yeah, Hi, it's thank Laurel. Oh, go ahead, Laurel. Go ahead, Laurel, do you have a question? Yeah, um, not a question, but another comment. Um, one of the organizations that um, she should probably look into is the ANTHC's LEO network. I don't exactly remember what the acronym stands for, but that one's about reporting different things that affect, um, that's just like absurdities within the environmental, I guess aspects of it, it's people taking out their phones and reporting an absurd um, and different thing that they've never seen before. Um, if she wants to look at that, I heard about it at a conference I was at in April, but I haven't looked at too much other than that. I know they have an app, but I don't, I used to have it on my phone, but I do not anymore. Yes, uh, this, is, this is Guillermo. The Leo Network is the local environmental observer uh, network uh, our regional office in alaska um, it's uh, handling one of the funding um, avenues for uh, leo um, leo now is panarctic so it's, it's it has gone international uh, to the uh, norwegian arctic and other countries it's um, an initiative under the umbrella of the Arctic Council. So it's expanding, it's very international, and if you need any contacts, uh, please uh, let me know, or I think uh, my colleague, uh, James Lima, thank you for, thank you, James, for uh, typing the link in oh. the chat box. Oh. There it is. Got it. But that, that, that's a good suggestion. Thank you. Okay. okay. This is great. Thanks for these links and these suggestions. This is we want as many folks on in on this as we can get, and uh, yeah, make that network happen. Hmm. All right. Well, thanks everyone for participating, um, and I really want to appreciate thanks uh, to all the presenters today uh, from near and far, and everyone that asked a comment, asked a question, or had a comment and for everyone else for participating. And I think this talk has been recorded and so it'll get posted on the collaboration team website. So if you wanna share that with anyone, feel free in the presentations there as well. Um, we will have another meeting in October 
and that's posted on the website too. Uh, there's two researchers that have been working really closely with communities out on the Yukon Delta, and they're going to talk about that work and how they've worked with folks to address environmental monitoring and some questions that people out there really have um, on their minds. And a lot of that deals with landscape change and berry uh, harvests, berry plant harvests. So we'll be looking into that in early October. So stay tuned for that meeting. Um, and before we hang up, any other comments or questions? Heather, what species are you seeing recruiting in Alaska or in Prince William Sound? Oh, um, I'd have, gosh, I'd have to look at the data, but I think it's um, Evisterius and some small Pycnopodias, but I will double check and I will email you. Yeah, that'd be really helpful. 